Hello there. Uh, the museum's asked me to uh, help out with a little reading exercise this afternoon. And uh, this is towards a uh, virtual presentation they're going to do later. Uh, my name is Alan McEwen. I'm a fourth generation uh, Pemberton Valley resident. Um, one of the many uh, Miller Ross Ronan clan that uh, developed after the uh, European settlers first arrived in the valley. Uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, grow up here in the valley with an extended family. Went to school here and uh, spent a lot of time uh, hunting and fishing and roaming the hills with my father and my grandfather. And uh, in the process kind of learned my way around, which has been great. Um, area of particular interest uh, has always been Tinkle Lake and the surrounding area. Um, when I was a kid I used to walk up and down the trail and admire the uh, axeman's work uh, when they cleared the trail. It'd be Ed Ronan or sometimes my grandfather Morgan Miller. And then uh, more recent years uh, that baton was passed to me and the uh, Pemberton Wildlife Association which I'm a long time member of. So we've spent uh, I think the last 30 years maintaining the trail and um, negotiating with the government to uh, keep the area pretty much the way Uncle Jack Ronan describes it here in the book um, and we're pretty proud of that. Um, I got a, a long time connection to the museum here and the book itself for that matter because I had the pleasure of knowing uh, Mr. and Mrs. Fulberg very well. Um, Mrs. Fulberg was my great aunt and I spent a lot of time at their place and with them uh, on various trips and roaming around uh, to their cabin at uh, Birkenhead Lake and uh, down to Skootenchuk to see the historical um, church and whatnot down there and many, many trips with them. And I was just mentioning to Nikki before we went on the air here that uh, I used to pop over to, to Fulberg's place. We lived right next door. and. Uh, I remember seeing the notes spread all over the dining room table uh, as Mrs. Fulberg and the other two authors, of course, were uh, putting the book together. And, and what a, a treat it is to have this book. And uh, I know I, I sat down this winter, we had a lot of time on our hands due to the pandemic, and I sat down and read it once again. But I, I, it's the sort of book where you, you have to go back to time and again to try and pick out all the little pieces uh, because I'm just old enough to remember a lot of the names, but too young to have actually met them or, uh, or shared in their experiences, which we're going to talk about today. So, without further ado, I'll, I'll launch into this reading that uh, Nikki and company have uh, brought out of the book for me. Okay, so I'll start into this uh, reading that Nikki's prepared for us, and it's, it's entitled The Lives of Early Settlers. Trapping, hunting, and hiking. Uh, the first chapter is uh, about pioneer living, and it starts off this way. Because all things brought from outside the area had to be transported 60 miles or more from one of three points, pioneers brought in few items not needed in everyday living. The largely self-sufficient life required regular work year-round, with intervals now and then for recreation and get-togethers with neighbors. Emergencies did arise, and those the iron-willed settlers dealt with as best they could. Furnishing of all kinds were few, simple, and improvised. Many of the people sat on homemade benches and chairs. Months before the annual shopping trip to Vancouver, which for the Punch family meant buying at Woodward's store, they prepared long lists of essentials. Coal oil, flour, kegs of molasses, cases of soap, dried fruit, salt, tea, and coffee, not forgetting the sugar. During the first winter of their marriage, Maria Punch and her young husband used their sugar too extravagantly, making candy and lots of it, until they realized that the sugar supply would not last. Then they sweetened old James Punch's desserts and ate sugarless pudding themselves. What a sacrifice. In the interest of survival, most pioneers would agree with waste not, want not, but some economies uh, may have been unduly rigid. Having butchered a beef, James Punch would decree that no cuts might be eaten until liver, heart, and tripe were gone. At one time, just before an election, the family 
had finished all the preliminaries except the tripe and the polling to be held at her house, Maria decided to serve tripe to all the voters who called. When the poll closed, old James found his daughter-in-law happily frying steaks. Many of the foods eaten were from the farm or the hills or the streams. Women made butter from cream, often skimmed by hand from pans of milk that had been sitting long enough for the fat to rise and sometimes had enough surplus butter to sell to the store or to road camps. They used water glass to preserve eggs for the cold season when hens were unlikely to lay. They pickled supplies of beef and pork or preserved them in glass jars. Many families ate venison to be good providers. Most husbands were generally good hunters. In pre-freezer days, women bottled and processed in a hot water bath most of their fruits, vegetables, and meat. Imagine on a hot summer day a woman stoking her wood fire for up to three or four hours to make sure that the water in the canner never stopped boiling and canning during the day because canning in the cooler evenings raised the house temperature too high for comfortable sleep. Taking advantage of the hot stove, the woman might do some baking or ironing, having heated the flat irons on the stovetop. A canning day was not entirely pleasant, but the result was a supply of food costing very little and providing almost instant meals for unexpected guests. Andy Anderson had his own method of preserving wild raspberries. Having filled his jars in the bush, he took them home, covered the fruit with boiling syrup, capped the jars, and rolled them in his sleeping bag until they were cool and the tops were set. Unfortunately, this relatively cool process could not be used generally. Throughout much of the season for gathering and preserving fruits and vegetables, mosquitoes filled the air, inside the house and out. Their incessant humming sounded like a thrashing machine, and everyone went around for weeks wearing a veil, even at times drinking water through the veil. A smudge was somehow smoldering shavings in a pan with grass and leaves thrown on top. A repellent, later in common use, perithium prout, perithrum powder was unavailable in the early years. After the main rush of summer work and after the snow had melted sufficiently at higher elevations, people could escape mosquitoes by spending holidays in the surrounding mountain country. Jack Ronan described how these annual mountain trips began. It was not until 1912 that I found behind the valley horizon at an altitude between 4,500 and 7,000 feet a charming land of little upland valleys gaily decorated with alpine flowers of every hue, park-like open spaces ornamented with clumps of balsam and pine, tumbling streams and pretty lakes crystal clear to the deepest blue in color, and for contrast, grim solitudes of snow and rock, altogether an ideal pleasure resort, especially for the leisure hours of the workers in the deep adjacent valley. In 1913, Jim Lansborough accompanied me to the same scenes for a week's holiday. And after that, every year between haying and harvest, an enthusiastic party of all ages took to the hills for their vacation. Even before these unforgettable days in the mountains, families found interesting ways to fill their leisure time. In summer, mosquitoes permitting, people enjoyed picnics. For a picnic, women dressed up in their wide brims hats and in their freshly washed starched and ironed blouses billowing over the waistbands of long skirts. Men and children too wore freshly laundered clothes. Then after the team had been hitched to the wagon, all climbed in as best they could and proceeded to some grassy spot to share the goodies the women had prepared. Clara Ryan, Ro sorry, Clara Ryan spent hours in Neil's meadow watching the beavers building their dam to keep their little lake as they wanted. One winter, James Ryan built his daughter a sleigh, like they used in the Yukon, and made a harness for her dog. She was then able to drive her mother miles down the valley, over the frozen snow, to meet Mrs. Neal. Rini Ronan paddled a canoe over the fields in water left by melting snow, and there were books to read. At intervals, Children with their parents visited neighbors' homes, riding in the wagon or on the sleigh. 
upper valley families like the Dermodys, Punches, Ronans, and Ryans could return the same day after visiting. But a trip to the races down the valley on July 1st included an overnight stay with friends. Visiting the Spetch home required a day both getting there and coming home. Visiting, uh, traveling to the halfway house on the Portage, operated after 1900 by Ronald Curry and his sister Annie McIntosh, meant two days going and returning, the first night visiting the Bowers or Neils, and the second at the stopping house. It was a small house, but to accommodate visitors, Mrs. McIntosh would arrange mattresses on the floors and provide blankets for all. Sometimes the routine of work and occasional visiting was interrupted by emergencies. At least one story tells of a man racked with pain, appendix close to bursting, riding over the trail to Squamish and traveling from there to Vancouver before he could get help. One known instance of nearly succumbing because of Pemberton's isolation is the experience of James Duff, who froze both feet. Few details survive of how he reached Lillooet, except that the Ronan brothers put him on a horse and took him to Anderson Lake, where they broke the ice to allow a boat to get away and head up towards the short potage between Anderson and Seton Lakes. A Bridge River Lillooet news account printed 30 years after the event just tells that Duff dragged himself from Pemberton. Dr. Green decided to cut off the frozen feet in order to save the man's life and called in Joe Russell, a Lillooet prospector, to help give Duff an anesthetic. Then while Joe helped, the doctor amputated the man's feet. For weeks, Duff lingered between life and death, then decided to get well. He recovered, brought himself two artificial feet and went back to Pemberton. After that, Duff continued to work at the first hatchery, a man of iron will. One time, the freight shed gang, youngsters who did a lot of good deeds in the community, could not understand Duff's rage when they bought him a can of sewing machine oil to lubricate his squeaking ankles. Uh, the next chapter is entitled Survival. Farming by itself could not support the needs of most settlers of Pemberton trail days because the settlers could market little except what could walk to Squamish, mainly beef animals. Once the pioneers had made a clearing, they were self-sufficient in some foods. Hunting might provide meat, and sometimes they bartered and exchanged farm products for fish or venison or for Indian labor. But because they needed dollars to buy many necessities, life was an unending struggle to develop the farm and at the same time to convert goods or services into cash. A very few managed to stay with their land and year by year put all their efforts into developing productive farms. Most had to seize every rare job opportunity. Some worked on bridges and trails, later on roads, and some eked out a living by prospecting. No settlers as trapping when Landsborough reached the valley, but as a child, Claire Jones saw Tom Greer come down from his trap line over a winter in which his curly black hair had grown long. After 1905, some men found casual employment at the Dominion Government Fish Hatchery, a few worked at the Dermody, later Perkins Sawmill, a number went to the coast to find work. But in order to prove up on Crown land, the preemptors among the settlers had to clear and improve their acreage. One pioneer described the mutual helpfulness of these men. Knowing that he would be away during the harvest, one would ask another to cut his oats and pit his spuds if she was not back in time. The answer was always, of course I will. In 1895, prospectors were at work on Pool Creek. One seam there between slate and granite formations was reported to be very rich in gold, silver, and copper. Two years later, after a summer of exploring for minerals down Lillooet Lake, A.P. Barnfield went north of, to the Blackwater, or Birkenhead, basin where miners were excited by copper deposits. Near the Birkenhead River, in the area worked over in the 1970s by Malibu mines, Will Miller had sunk a shaft. Later, Will Halemore staked claims at the north end of Birkenhead Lake and carved his name in the logs of the cabin which has recently collapsed beside Felix Creek. And then the next chapter called Work in the Woods and Mountains. Not all Pemberton settlers were farmers, and for one reason or another, many people worked 
not on the land, but in the woods and mountains, those areas which were also the holiday haunts of Pemberton settlers. Uncle Jack Ronan conducted more than one generation of children on climbs that took them to the surrounding peaks and on rambles that led them to lakes ringed with jewel-like flowers and alpine evergreens. And the children grew and ranged at will through all the lovely mountain country. Their summer pleasure grounds, though, were also the haunts of trappers and prospectors. Some men in the area trapping wild animals has been a good way to uh, earn extra cash. Edith Perkins says that in 1927, when she settled in the valley, bachelors were prospectors in the summer and trappers in the winter. Outnumbering present-day trappers, former trapp trappers often speak of life as it was up the rivers and creeks. Other men, men lived at home and trapped. Trap lines ran through such areas as McKibben Swamp, now an expanse of fields above Ryan Creek Bridge, or through the swamp that reclaimed as Gilmore's Farm, or through the Mackenzie Basin. Farmers like Jake Locken, John Arne, and Morgan Miller trapped in these former wet spots for muskrat and beaver. Trappers going up the Lillooet in the fall would have supplies of canned and dried foods, sugar, tobacco, and matches packed by horses, maybe to the headquarters cabin close to the junction of Meager Creek, the South Fork, and the main Lillooet, the North Fork. Once two men made their way up to the forks, confident that not many days behind a packer with his horses was following. While they waited, one shot a deer and cut the meat in strips and left it hanging. When more than two weeks had passed, they became alarmed about the packer and decided to look for him. To their astonishment and displeasure, they found him still in Pemberton, not yet ready to leave. On their return with the pack train to headquarters, they had one source of satisfaction. The strips of venison were by then perfect jerky. Food packed up from the settlement was generally supplemented with venison, the occasional fish, and sometimes ice cream made by stirring snow into canned milk, then adding sugar and flavoring. After establishing themselves for the trapping season, the men would spend several weeks on their lines and then come down for a Christmas break. On snowshoes, they might travel from headquarters to Hamels, a distance of about 25 miles in a little more than three hours. After selling their furs they had packed out with them, they would return to their cabins and stay until May. Several women went with their husbands to the trap line. One was Edith Perkins. At that time, she usually wore riding breeches and high lace boots. She braided her red hair and wound it around her head. When her, with her husband, more than once, she summered at the forks and about 1928 planted a garden there. Beginning about 1940, both Kathleen Lundgren and Phyllis Erickson also went on what seemed daring expeditions into the wilds. After one Christmas holiday, when the Lundgrens were ready to return upriver, there was so little snow that a friend was able to drive them in a truck as far as the deserted Hamel house. After they had lighted a fire and brewed coffee, they struck off on snowshoes, heading for the headquarters 40 miles up the Lillooa. The river being low, they traveled for miles on sandbars and without too much difficulty forded when necessary. Phyllis Erickson found the trapper's life to be a hard one. She did not mind crawling through brush or walking for seven or eight hours a day on snowshoes, but she did mind the monotonous, limited diet. I never did like beans, she said. Beans, macaroni, and rice were the staples. And as the years went by, as the roads became just a little bit better, the Perkins family freighted in supplies for the Ericksons. Dried fruits was more varied, Phyllis Erickson says, and her husband built a small root house in which they stored vegetables from their farm. Each spring, green leaves brought hope, and the couple cheered up. Leaving the comparative isolation of Pemberton with its twice-weekly trains, people like the Ericksons were almost completely isolating themselves. Seemingly, no one died as a result of illnesses or accidents on the trap lines, although anticipating a severe attack of appendicitis, one trapper carefully plotted the stages of the operation he would perform upon himself. I'm glad he didn't have to do that. Edith Perkins describes an experience in October 1931 when she and her husband had summered at the headquarters cabin. 
as in 1975, a huge section of mountain slid into Meager Creek. The river rose three feet in three minutes, and driftwood filled it from bank to bank. This raging lasted five minutes by my watch. Per Perkins said it looked like an old-time river drive, and although Edith had never seen an old-time river drive, she did know the scent of alpine timber, and the air was full of it. The river dropped to normal, but half an hour later rose higher than before. We could see the rise this time two distinct elevations like broad porch steps. It swept across the bar, jammed the creek near our cabin, and backed up all over. By this time we were out of doors and my husband worked to clear the jam in our creek. I watched him from the bank. He was still working, but his back to the river, admiring his handiwork, when I saw the third wave coming. Get out, I shouted. He showed his manly independence by dancing a jig on the foot log. I screamed and pointed. He looked behind him and he moved, rapidly. As his feet hit the bank, a rush of water carried the log away. My hair has never flattened. Usually, trappers spaced their cabins about a day's hike apart. Some confusion overtook the men of one partnership when, after building a cabin, they sallied forth with their tools to build a second one. They followed a twisting trail with the tools becoming heavier on their shoulders. Finally, they found a likely site and built their second cabin. They realized later that, as the crow flies, they were only two miles from their first, but when they eventually quarreled and decided to live apart, they found uses for both structures. One trapper had a surprising fear of being attacked at night by ferocious wild animals. To safeguard himself, he drove spikes closely together around the foot and the outer side of his bunk, and then filed the top of each spike to create rows of sharp, protruding barbs to impale any attacker. Men still talk about another trapline oddity, Big Red Mahan's tiny cabin. At night, well before bedtime, he let his fire die down until his stove was cool enough to handle. Then he moved it outside. Only then did he have room enough to go to bed. The trapper's main interests were marten, weasel, muskrat, and beaver. Only after a mink rancher at Alta Lake gave up a losing proposition and turned his animals loose where there mink in any number. Winter after winter, never varying, one man's line yielded him 60 marten, and during the Depression each pelt brought $12, about twice the price it would bring 40 years later. More than once, potential emergencies developed. In a blizzard working on the Elaho River, which has the same headwaters as Meager Creek, one man thought he turned back to the cabin, which he shared with another trapper. Finally, realizing where he was, he headed towards the hot spring cabin. There, by midnight, he lighted a bug made of jam, of a jam can and a candle, with a wire attached to the can to form a handle. And bug in hand, he started off on the 12 or 15 mile hike to the Elo cabin, which he reached before daybreak and where his partner was waiting until dawn before going to look for him. At night in the cabins, besides cooking their meals, the men had to skin and stretch their catch, maintain their rubber hip boots and their snowshoes in good condition, and wash and mend their clothes. Of course, some of these jobs could be delayed until weather forced the trappers to stay in their homes, but one meticulous housekeeper among them had a regular routine for washing dish towels, of which he had 23. At the end of three weeks, he would wash the towels, boil them in lye water, and then rinse them many times before hanging them to dry. No other man could be trusted with that job. Sometimes snow fell for days on end. The trappers read by candlelight the well-worn magazines they had read the year before. They would play crib or poker. They might try to get reception on a crystal radio set, but so rarely with any results that batteries lasted a long time. Year after year, the trappers returned to the upriver areas. Kirstead, Perkins, and Tom Greer parked, trapped up there early. In 1929, Perkins' trap line extended along the main Lillooet for some distance below Meager Creek, and Oscar John Johnson was on Meager Creek itself. In that year, Anderson, who already had a line in the general area, and Slim Fober took over both the Perkins and Johnson lines. In 1931, Perkins returned to trap with Fober. Lumbering work was slim and 
in the winter of 38-39 when they traveled across to the Ilo River, the waters of which flow into the Squamish. Sai Keys trapped in the areas of North and South Creeks, but not above them, and on the Kirsted Creek, partway up Railroad Pass. Henry Erickson took over his line. John Arne worked in the pass above Keys, up Donnelly Creek, and on the Hurley River. Trapping was obviously of an economic importance to the area. The Pemberton and District Board of Trade, whose members include some trappers as well as loggers, prospectors, farmers, and businessmen, decided to investigate financial returns from trapping, and the records show that during one year in the 30s, fur shipments brought $15,000 to the valley. In Pemberton, summer is the only season for prospecting, and when summer came, some trappers and some others made their way into the mountains with specialized tools for investigating possible ore deposits. For many years, from the early days of settlement until the present, men have prospected in the mountains surrounding the valley and the general area. To date, though, no mine has produced anything of importance. And that, I believe, is the end of the piece that Nikki asked me to uh, read. And just a comment on the trapping. Um, I was I took over a trap line from my grandfather. Actually, I had the pleasure of, of trapping with him up in the headwaters of Miller Creek in 1980. And he had built a, a, one of those tiny little cabins. We didn't have to take the stove out, but we uh, uh, certainly had to monitor how much wood we put in it. And we did exactly as was just described. Uh, we, because it was dark at four o'clock in December, we uh, we spent the late afternoon and early evening skinning the marten we had picked up as we uh, climbed up to the cabin. So uh, that lifestyle went on for a long time. Unfortunately, uh, the trapping has has declined dramatically now. Both the price of furs and the availability of the animals themselves is. Um, or has, has diminished, let's say. So the logging has um, taken out some of the habitat that, uh, that the marten preferred, so the mature forests are, have, a lot of them have been logged and that would change it. Now we hope they'll come back someday, but right now the trapping is uh, considerably less than it was. And I think eventually we'll see far fewer of those small trap lines that were described and and maybe one or two larger ones, which would give a person room to kind of roam and make it sustainable. Anyway, thanks for the opportunity to come in and, uh, and speak today. Always a pleasure to uh, sort of dwell on the pages of this book, and I hope everybody enjoyed that.